Good afternoon, everybody. We will continue talking about uh, Manuel Kant today, but um, as promised, first we will talk about the essay. Uh, so let's just go over everything. Uh, first of all, remember it is due November 22nd. So today is November 4th, so you have 18 days. Next week we will only have the exam and um, there is no class on the 11th. So you will have plenty of time to explore, hopefully start writing before uh, 16th when our next class will be after today. And then following the 16th you will still have some time to finish it off so hopefully that is enough time um, I definitely should now start thinking about it and the list with all the essay questions is already there on uh, canvas you can find it either on the front page I uh, placed it where the lectures are or you can look at the files and see it in files either way you can find it take a look at it there are 10 different subjects one question per each uh, philosopher which we covered um, starting from the beginning starting from Socrates and ending with Kant uh, so you can pick any one of them but make sure that it is actually one you cannot use more than one in one essay it has to be an essay on that subject uh, you may wonder, well, what if I don't have enough to say? Well, if you don't have enough to say, then you should read more, um, explore more, and get more stuff to say. Because I can assure you, thousand word essay is entirely possible to write on any of these questions. Um, and again, I did talk about it a little bit before, but let me just repeat that uh, your essay should center on the question at hand and should answer this question. Uh, if you put stuff there which I don't think is necessary, that will just water it down. That, of course, will affect your grade. So, is it okay to give me some information, background information on the philosopher? Well, a little bit. But um, I have seen essays in the past where it's like two-thirds of the essay somebody's talking to me about uh, Plato's family and what year he was born and um, you know his biography pretty much it has nothing to do with the question I mean um, in a 1000 word essay you cannot spend too much time talking about um, Plato's history and so on um, you have to concentrate on the subject and uh, another problem would be to use too many quotes. Again, quotes should support what you are saying, not the other way around. You cannot have more than half of your essay just um, copy-paste it from somewhere else, even if you uh, put references to it. But keep in mind that the, every time you borrow something from somewhere else, you have to reference it. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. You cannot... Um, and that even include stuff which you put in your own words that's another thing you should keep in mind if you read it somewhere and you are just retelling it in your own words you have to give me the source I read it there and there or as such and such said um, and if you just quote it um, exactly word to word from somewhere else you definitely should give me a source there's no doubt about that um, because otherwise like I said it is plagiarism uh, always make sure you put the question you selected at the top of the essay so it would be clear what question are you actually answering um, now the size like I said should be 1000 words anywhere between 900 and 1100 is fine obviously you cannot get it at exactly 1000 if it's 950 920 if it's 1050 that's fine but you cannot go anywhere below 900 or over 1100 because if you go below 900 that's just too short and then 
you are not following the requirements. And if you go over 1100, which rarely, but it does actually happen, that is also a problem. So for every word, um, every 20 words below or above this level, I will be deducting additional 1% penalty after I grade it. Because like I said, you should really edit it so it would be within this um, framework. And in Word, you can immediately see how many words you have. It actually has an option. Um, don't try to make it PDF or something so I wouldn't be able to check it. I can still check it and that's not going to work. In, by the way, I will create uh, on Turnitin assignment on Turnitin. The link will be on Canvas. So if you go on Canvas and click on that link, this is where you will be submitting this. Turnitin also automatically checks for plagiarism. Anything you borrowed from whatever source, uh, they have the huge database and they like search the web and whatever. So they actually immediately tell me where it came from. So if you borrowed it from somewhere, like I said, you definitely have to uh, mention that fact. And you cannot have more than 50% similarity index. I don't know for some reason students keep on telling me they cannot see the similarity index there. Uh, well, I can see it. Uh, there's no really need to ask me because if I see right away that it's over 50%, I'll tell you. That is very rare. It's extremely rare. It only happens when people really have like either the whole thing plagiarized or they have so many quotes there that there's barely any of their own words. Um, usually you would see something like 10, 20% similarity. That is okay. That is acceptable. So don't worry too much about it, but you definitely don't want to uh, borrow too much from any source. If the similarity is over 50%, I will reject your essay. I will let you know, of course, that I'm rejecting it. Then you will have to redo it. Um, but like I said, it is kind of unlikely. And I think students are a little paranoid about that because I get many messages from students. Is it 50%? Is it 50%? And then I look at it and it's like 5%. So don't worry too much about that. Because if you are um, genuinely writing it yourself, that should never be the case. Okay, now, um, is there any questions about the paper? Anything? Is that all clear? Well, if you come upon the question you have later on, you can always just uh, send me a message and ask me and I can tell you too. So it's not a problem. Right, now let's look back at Kant because we will be finishing with Kant today. Um, what kind of change of view that took place in history did Kant compare his philosophy to? And remember, this is also a review for the upcoming exam. So you do have to know answers to these questions. So what specifically did he compare his philosophy to? Copernican revolution, Copernican turn. Okay, what kinds of judgments and what kinds of knowledge Kant distinguished? We did talk about it last time. We didn't get to nominal yet. Nominal will be today. We didn't even mention this word. And that could be from the reading or something. But that was not in the lecture. Synthetic and analytic, that would be judgments and kinds of knowledge. A priori and a posteriori. This is the uh, two. Let me actually quickly Again, sum it up for you guys on the board because that may be kind of confusing. So again, the judgments he's saying could be synthetic and analytic. And to go together with them, 
we can have a posteriori and a priori knowledge. Now this one is prior to experience and this one is after the experience. Now this makes a natural pair in each case, right? Uh, knowledge which we gain after the experience typically is synthetic because it gives it, it lets us connect two otherwise unconnected uh, concepts such as bachelor and being six feet tall. Remember, that's the example we used last time. If somebody is a bachelor, is he actually six feet tall or not? How can we know that? We can only know that if we do the experiment, if we experience that. Now here, again, a natural pair a priori prior to experience knowledge is mainly analytic. And that would be something like bachelor is unmarried. Yes, bachelor means unmarried. You don't need any experience to understand that. This is what you get from analyzing the concept of a bachelor. Now remember Kant was mainly interested in this type. He was saying, well, but there can be a priori synthetic types of judgments. And how are they possible? And remember why it's important. That's actually his answer, among other things, to Hume's skepticism. Hume was saying, how can we possibly know the causality, that one thing causes the other? Uh, we can only see it in experience. Kant say no, it is prior to experience. But it does give us certain knowledge of reality because it actually does connect these two concepts, cause and effect, in a meaningful way, teaching us something. And he is trying to explain why exactly that is the case. Okay. Hopefully, uh, it's more clear now. What is a thing in itself? Another very important part of the last lecture. Don't tell me you missed it completely. What is a thing in itself? Well, that's actually where nominal and phenomenal will come in today. Okay, let me again explain that part. Uh, because it is important. The name kind of speaks for itself. Uh, I don't think it is as much about remembering. If you understand it once, you will always remember it. Uh, the answer is probably you just don't understand it. So let's try again. Um, this is our mind. This is some sort of a thing. Whatever it may be, say a marker, a ball, a table, a chair, anything. How are we related to that thing? So remember, uh, the traditional point of view is that we get some sort of visual, sensual feed from the thing. We can see it, we can sense it. And that's how we actually get that thing. Uh, but Kant saying this, well, that is partly true. There is a matter of experience there. Um, however, we also contribute something to that. The form of experience is part of our mental software. That is something we put into anything we encounter because of the way our mind works, the way our uh, conceptual system works. Remember, again, intuitions in particular. Space and time. They are not part of the real world as it is in itself. This is something we put into everything. This is part of our mind. Now, if we ever were able to experience the thing without that, without all this form we contribute, that would be a thing in itself.
that would be the thing as it is outside of space outside of time also outside of all the concepts our understanding uses for everything so for example a concept of a marker how do we know it's a marker well we have a concept of a marker that's already right here in our mind we when we see it kind of applying that to that particular marker so this is how it works with everything we experience in reality around us but if we could somehow experience it outside of our mind without any of these other things that would be the thing in itself okay hopefully that is clear too uh, so what according to Kant are the two forms of intuition space and time exactly uh, and what are the objects we find within experience product of what it process well let me tell you because I don't know if you got it uh, from what I was saying synthesizing activity of our mind our mind synthesizes them puts them together from the matter of experience which is uh, something our senses get from the outside world and the form of experience including space time um, and the concept of understanding which are kind of our mental software so anything we encounter is the combination of this and um, it is of course important in order to understand phenomena and nomena which we did not even mention last time what exactly is it well the phenomena is things as they appear to us um, anything we encounter around us is a phenomena objects as we know them this is phenomena uh, the table is a phenomena and so on Phenomenal world, in practical sense, is the real world. That's the world we know. Now, what exactly is noumena? Aha, noumena, that is the world of completely unknowable thing in itself. So if we go back here, this is the distinction here. This would be noumena. And this would be phenomena. So phenomena... Phenomenal world, regular world, just like we know it. Nominal world, something we cannot know. Why can't we know that? Well, because we are not made to know that. Our entire conceptual apparatus, our entire um, being is created in order to operate within the phenomenal world. So we're simply not made to go outside of that. And this is actually what we are trying to go to um, when we do metaphysics. And Kant is saying in particular that uh, you can't even say meaningfully thing in itself or noumena. To him it what he calls limiting concept. What does that mean? Well, basically, instead of talking about a thing in itself, itself, what you are saying is, well, there's this boundary and there's something behind it. And you can't go behind this boundary. Uh, because anything we do, note that we use language, right? We use the concepts which we speak and understand with. So how can you explain something if you do not have words for it? If you do not have um, understanding to approach this? Um, you can't. You cannot meaningfully talk about it whatsoever. Anything you say would revert back to the reality you know. So you'd be just using um, all these images which you're familiar with. And this is what we are doing anytime we are trying to talk about such things as God, for example. That would be one of the examples. How do we talk about God? We imagine God as another human being, a dude, an older dude uh, somewhere who has similar process of thinking as we do. He can get mad, he can be annoyed, he can reward us or punish us. Uh, 
which is very human concepts, isn't it? This is really not something we would be uh, talking about if, for example, it was not human being. But that's all we can think about, because that's how we operate. Uh, so he's saying uh, that we have these illusions, transcendental illusions of metaphysics, which uh, our pure reason kind of creates. Now remember, the book is called Critique of Pure Reason. This is one of the reasons why it's called Critique of Pure Reason, because he's trying to criticize the pure reason specifically for this, for creating those illusions. Um, pure reason does that in order to um, make our existence easier. It's just kind of something we add to our existence in order to make it more meaningful and um, go on with the life in a smoother smoother way. So the problem is that uh, reason falls into the trap of applying the categories uh, of understanding, which again should apply only to phenomenal world, to uh, something which goes beyond that, something which we're trying to understand metaphysically. Uh, in particular, the three transcendental ideas of pure reason which he talks about in that is the self, the cosmos, and God. Uh, so what's going on there? Well, first of all, the self. Uh, remember that this is something which Descartes started with, and Descartes was saying that he found that uh, when he was talking about um, doubting everything except... Uh, the fact that he exists as a thinking thing. Now, Hume, of course, did say that he did not find anything there. Hume was criticizing him. Hume, in particular, was saying that all we have is this flow of constant emotions. Where is the self? There is no self there. Um, so, Kant actually kind of combines that in a sense. Uh, he's saying, well... Contrary to Hume, even though we cannot experience the self the way Descartes thought we can, and we cannot, but uh, we kind of need this concept. It is one of those concepts which helps us to uh, exist. It's necessary condition of experience to have some unity which experiences the things around us. So while it is not a substance, nonetheless, it's not an empty concept. He called it a transcendental ego. Um, ego, by the way, that's a Greek word which means I. In ancient Greek, ego means I. Um, so essentially, transcendental ego would be a transcendental I, or the way each one of us is uh, outside of this phenomenal reality. So on that scheme which we created, we would put it here. Note that because of the way uh, things are, it's outside of space and outside of time. It is you and me and each one of us outside of space and outside of time. How can we even imagine that? Well, we can't. That's what Kant is saying. We can't imagine that. Nonetheless, this is this kind of a, a necessary concept which we have to keep in mind. Now, uh, he also calls it transcendental unity of our perception. So this is kind of this point where everything we experience kind of um, comes together. And it is necessary because if we do not have that concept, if we agree with Hume that all we have is this flow of emotion, then the world outside of us suddenly has no meaning and nothing really uh, makes sense. So this is a nomena. This is an example of nomena. In the same time, the reason I, self, in phenomenal world, 
that would be the self which Descartes has found. That would be uh, the thinking process. Because note that thinking process takes place in time. Doesn't it? You cannot think outside of time. Uh, so that is a good example why it is actually a phenomenal, empirical self. That empirical self is what psychology studies. What does psychology do? Uh, well, all sorts of experiments, right? If any of you guys major in psychology, you probably have uh, learned about some of these experiments, like the prison one, where they made some of the uh, people uh, into prisoners and the other ones into guards and how they observed them. Well, uh, what do they do? They study how people actually behave in particular um, space-time environment. So naturally that would be empirical self. But this is different from the transcendental self. Now, to briefly discuss that. So do you agree with Kant that all you know of yourself is changing empirical self? Uh, or do, in, do you like him find it necessary to think of nominal self that lies beyond the reach of scientific analysis? Does that uh, kind of distinction make sense to you guys? Well, it's not experience itself, right? Because we're talking about the self. We're talking about you. And you is not just an experience. Um, but the empirical self would be the way you kind of feel yourself throughout time as... When you say me, I am hungry, I am uh, excited, I am in love. So who are you talking about? Well, you're talking about an individual who lives in time. Uh, but the distinction is that there is something behind that. And by the way, when we talk about Schopenhauer, this will be the key to Schopenhauer too. So if you want to understand Schopenhauer, you have to understand the distinction. How is this other self different? Well, it is outside of time. This is you, essentially, but it is the part of you which is not in time. This is kind of an eternal you. This is something somewhere which kind of drives you. Let's put it this way. Well, the soul is just another word for it, I suppose. Uh, naturally, that would not be the soul which uh, religion talks about. There is a, a difference here because for religion there is no, no distinction between the empirical self and that transcendental self. Uh, in order to understand this distinction, you have to apply this uh, division. You have to apply the fact that... Uh, it is outside of space and time and so on, uh, which is not really how religion explains it. Anyway, well, let's look um, a little bit further into his philosophy. Uh, the other transcendental illusion uh, would be connected to the uh, world as totality or unthinkable cosmos. And this is an interesting, very interesting part uh, of critique of pure reason when he starts talking about it. So he basically says, um, he calls it antinomies, antinomies of pure reason. Uh, these are two contradictory statements, but the curious thing about them, both of them make perfect sense for us. Um, and yet they contradict each other. So let's take a look at them. Um, this is the antinomies he mentions there. One of them is the world had a beginning in time and is limited in space. Doesn't it make sense? I mean, wouldn't you agree that the world should have a beginning in time and be limited in space? Who, how could it not? Uh, I mean, what would that even be if it's not limited in space? What would that be if it didn't have a beginning? Um, it's impossible for us to really imagine eternity. I mean, we can say it like, oh, it's eternal, but we don't even understand it. But in the same time, equally perfectly sensible uh, would be to say, no, it had no beginning in time 
and it actually is infinite in time and space. Why does that make sense? Well, because imagine the beginning in time of you everything. So natural question would be, well, what was before that? Nothing. What does that mean? Can you imagine the time where there was nothing? Not like an empty space, but literally absolutely nothing. Uh, you can again say the word, but can you really imagine that? Same thing with the um, limit in space. What does that mean? So there's the end of the world, and then what? Is that like the wall, and you hit it, and you can't go uh, beyond that wall? Uh, how come? What does that mean? Or you just disappear if you get to that? Or what, what happens? Uh, it seems like um, another one of uh, these things which makes sense for us. So both of us of them know it makes sense. And both of them don't. Now another one is everything can be analyzed into basic elements. Nothing can be analyzed into basic elements. Again, this is the pair which we discussed before. Because think about it. Uh, first of all, everything has to have this smallest particle, right? We talked about it. Even though they have split the atom, but they found electrons, uh, positrons, and all this stuff inside of the atom. Even though they split that too, they found quarks inside. And now they are talking if you split the quarks, you will still find uh, the strings. And it makes sense, because how could you not have this smallest particle there, right? It would be nothing, so everything is nothing. But, in the same time, again, just like we talked before, um, it is equally meaningful and sensible for us to say, well, but then how can there be smallest particle? Wouldn't then we be able to split it again? And if we can, then what? Is that like infinite division? But that doesn't make any sense. Now, the third one is uh, freedom of the will and determination. And again, um, both of them make perfect sense for us if you think about it. Some events are free and undetermined. That's how we operate, right? That's why we think we are free to do things the way we want to do them. Uh, because we believe in freedom. We believe that some human actions are completely undetermined. I can get up now and walk outside if I want to. And uh, there's no reason that I would not be able to do that. In the same time, I can equally stay in this chair. And it's entirely up to me which one of them would I do. But in the same time, uh, physics and all the laws of causality tell us, no, there's no freedom. How can there be freedom? Everything is determined by the previous cause. So even if I think that I can go outside this door for no reason, but I can't. In fact, if I do that, uh, that will just prove that I have a reason to do that. Even if this reason is just to prove that I uh, can do that. Well, that's the reason. If I have absolutely no reason to do that, I would never do that. And finally, um, relation to God. Uh, there is necessary being in the universe, being God, or there is not a necessary being in the universe. And again, both of them kind of make sense. Because remember all these proofs of existence of God and so on, it does seem very, very reasonable to think that there is actually some sort of necessary being, some sort of God. But the criticism of them also makes sense, which is why many people do not believe in God. And saying, how can we uh, imagine anything like that? It's impossible. So, this is the antinomies. What is Kant actually saying about all that? Uh, well, he's saying that if you pick any one of the two, you are guilty of dogmatism. That actually is not uh, what we can do. Because if you, for example, definitely say that there is God, you are definitely uh, committing a fallacy here. Just equally if you're saying there is a beginning of the universe. Equally if you're saying there is no beginning of the universe. Any one of the um, pair picked will either commit you to dogmatic uh, rationalism or dogmatic empiricism, depending on which one do you pick. Uh, so, remember, dogmatic rationalism makes claims about nomina. It starts talking about uh, the left side of the board. 
and you can't. You cannot talk about that. It's a limit. Um, but dogmatic empiricists um, says that there is no such thing whatsoever. Just phenomenal world is the only world there is. And it's again a fallacy because you can't uh, claim that either. What's the solution though? Well, the solution Kant suggests is this. One and two are both false. Both of them are false. In fact, you cannot really um, talk about these things because our brain, our mind, isn't meant to think of the world as a totality. We can't do that. So going back to them, to say the world had a beginning, equally false as to say the world had no beginning. Simply because the term beginning cannot be applied to that. Um, similarly, everything can be analyzed into basic elements. Nothing can be analyzed into basic ele elements. That again is a mistake of reasoning because the term elements simply cannot be applied to that. It's more complicated than that and we are trying to talk about it using our human concept of element which is not meant for this kind of exercise. Um, and three and four, he's saying are actually both true. That um, as amazing as it may seem to us. So to take, for example, freedom, uh, it is equally true that there is freedom and it is equally true that there is no freedom. Huh, how can that be, can you, you can ask? Well, very simply, uh, because of this distinction. So there is freedom here. Freedom in part of nominal world. There is determination here. Everything in phenomenal world has cause and effect. Um, this is causal relations. It's impossible to think of anything in phenomenal world without cause and effect. But in nominal world, there actually is freedom. And the other one about necessary being God. Yes, again, here there is God. And here there is no God. So essentially what it's saying is uh, God is one of those nominal concepts which we can't even talk about because our mind is not made for that. As far as phenomenal world, the world of science is concerned, there's no God. We will never find him with a microscope or some sort of experiment because he is here. He's on that side. Okay, uh, so those are the antinomies and his approach to them. Now, he then goes on and his other work, uh, he wrote Critique of Practical Reason, when he starts talking more about the uh, how should we lead, the morality, the morals, what should we do in this life. So he's saying the morality, the idea of morality is fully supported by this nominal side by God and freedom, because if there's no God and no freedom, again, remember, you can't talk about morality. You cannot say it's wrong to murder somebody if everything is determined by these causal relations. Then the murderer will answer you, I couldn't do anything. You know, those atoms, man, they interacted in my brain and made me do that. I have no freedom. You can only do that if you accept the left side of the board. If you say, well, there are some things which we don't fully know, which are actually things in themselves, and freedom is part of that world. Uh, so he's saying if there is no original being different from this world, being God, if the world is without a beginning and also without an offer, if our will is not free and our soul is of the same divisibility and corruptibility as matter, then moral ideas and principles lose all validity and they collapse along with transcendental ideas that constitute their theoretical support. Uh, God himself, again according to Kant, is neither provable nor disprovable. He goes over all these arguments for the existence of God 
ontological, cosmological, teleological, the ones we discussed before, and he more or less has similar criticism to Hume. He's saying uh, ontological argument, remember that's the one where you say God which exists is more perfect than God which doesn't exist, therefore um, since by definition God is the most perfect being, it means God exists. He's saying no, you cannot uh, really connect the existence as some sort of perfection to the concept. Existence is not a perfection. Existence is a property and that can only be discovered through experiments in phenomenal world. Um, now the most we can say based on that is if there is a God then there is a being that necessarily exists. That would be the condition we need in order to apply this concept of God as existing thing. But whether God exists or not can only be determined through experimentation and that cannot work in case of God. Existence itself is not a predicate. You cannot uh, just attach it to a concept. It is has to be synthetic. Cosmological argument that is every event has a cause therefore the world should have a cause and that causes God. That again according to uh, that explanation which we already went through fails. Why? Because cause and effect can only apply to phenomenal world. You cannot even apply them to nominal world and to God. Uh, therefore it's meaningless. That doesn't work in order to prove God's existence. It doesn't work in order to disprove it either. It simply does not apply. It's an attempt to use our human reasoning to understand the divine causes. And finally teleological, so-called teleological argument from design. Kant says it is actually very respectful. That's the argument that the world has this amazing organization. It is um, it seems to be purposeful, it seems to develop towards a particular goal. So, uh, doesn't it mean that there should be God in charge of that? And uh, Kant is saying, well, this is of course the oldest, the clearest and most according to common reason argument. Nonetheless, know that all it can uh, prove is that there is some sort of an architect, like an engineer behind the world, not a creator. It doesn't prove the world was created by uh, God. It just proves that there should be some sort of force which kind of um, works on it constantly and perhaps makes it better than it would have been otherwise. That's the most we can hear uh, prove. If we want to prove that there is actually a creator, we have to go back to the previous argument, the cosmological one, and it fails again. Um, so overall, we cannot conform or deny the existence of God. So in that sense, he kind of agrees with Hume uh, that you can no, neither um, say there is no God or that there is God. Um, all these concepts are illusions. God, freedom, and self. But they are irresistible illusions and they have regulative purpose for us. So why is he saying they are illusions? Because again, what he says is we cannot know the nominal world. We cannot even meaningfully talk about it. So every time he is doing it himself, he again is kind of, um, I guess, kidding himself. And we all kid ourselves when we think we can actually do that. So, but they are necessary in order for us to have normal life because again it's impossible to live the life without the concept of the self understanding you as some sort of an entity uh, without the concept of God who again serves as a guarantor of this morality and the idea of a cosmos or the universe as we perceive that irresistible illusions and this is again leads towards his ethics his ethics which he developed in um, two mainly works, Foundations of Metaphysics of Morals and Critique of Practical Reason, are completely built on that. We have very little time left for his ethics, but just uh, briefly, um, he again considered the Copernican Revolution because he is turning our idea about morality um, 
just as he did with the other uh, step. So he's saying the good will is the most important part in our lives. Nothing in the world can possibly be conceived which could be called good without qualification except the good will. So the most important part here is that uh, we have a duty. We have a duty to use our reason to organize the world in the way that would be uh, the best, the best way to organize reality. How exactly do we do that? Uh, well, uh, we use our sense of duty. For this reason, it's called deontological ethics, uh, different from teleological ethics. Teleological ethics says that uh, we do things for a particular result. So, for example, we organize the world in a certain way because we want to be happy in this world. Kant goes the other direction. He's saying, no, uh, we actually shouldn't care as much about that. We should just organize it according to reason and laws of logic um, and feel it as our duty. How can that actually work out? Well, um, here's an example. Suppose Heidi walking by and there is a child drowning. So um, she has a moral duty to save this child. Therefore, she should tell herself, I must do something. I must save this child. Now, of course, she could fail. She could not uh, get the child, save the child, right? But, according to Kant, that doesn't matter. What matters is that she acts out of her duty. She actually um, understands it as her duty to do something about the child and save the poor child from drowning. Note the difference between actually saying, I will do it because I want the child saved, and I will do it because it's my duty to do it, regardless of the consequence. Because in the first sense, you may also say to yourself, well, I want this child saved, but I don't know if I can actually accomplish that. Uh, why would I bother trying to save the child if it doesn't look like I can even do that? But in the second case, if you are working from duty, then you don't care about that. You actually don't care if you will be able to save the child, but you just feel like it is your duty to do something about it, end of story, period, even if you will fail. Um, so that is the important difference there. Not the consequence of your action which matters, but the intention. Why are you doing it? Uh, also important, what specifically is driving you? So, for example, uh, suppose that Heidi wanted to achieve this good result, save the child, for wrong reason. What would be the wrong reason? Well, maybe she's running for the mayor, right? And she wanted um, people to vote for her because they would think, oh, look, she's so brave, she saved the child. Now, that, according to Kant, would immediately validate the whole uh, moral worth of the whole action because her motivation now is wrong. She is acting out of pure self-interest, and that is not good. She should do it from her moral duty. Uh, how about the feelings? Are there any feelings? Remember, Hume, for Hume, feelings and passion was the most important part when it comes to morality, not for Kant. He's saying, actually, feelings don't matter. So, another example, suppose that a child is crying while she's drowning. And Heidi tries to save her, not because she thinks it's the right thing to do, but because those cries, they are just so disturbing. She doesn't want to hear them. So she feels bad, not because of the child drowning, but because of the ye yelling and the commotion, which makes her irritated. Um, again, that would be wrong way to um, approach that. That means... She is not being truly moral at all. Uh, it is only rational principles which everything should be based on. Uh, okay, so think about it for a moment. I'll be right back, but let's discuss a little bit. Do you agree with Kant that neither consequences nor feelings should play a role in making moral judgment? Let's actually make it a poll. Yes or no? Do you agree with that?
and I'll be right back. Okay, uh, so we have results almost from everybody except uh, Daniel and Yadira, who I guess are not listening. <laughs> That's the only explanation I can have. All right, anyway, so five people agree with Kant. Uh, two people disagree. So why why would you agree with him? Why would you disagree? Anybody cares to elaborate? Let's put first of all people who disagree. Uh, why do you disagree with that? That probably is more interesting. They think that feelings and consequences should play a role. You think so you think it's literally impossible for us to do good things unless we personally gain something from them. So you would never do the good just for the sake of the good. Anybody else? Anything else? You guys keep on typing something, but nothing <laughs> seems to be coming out of it. <laughs> I'm just waiting and waiting, and there's nothing new there. Oh, so you are actually saying from agreeing with Kant. Yeah, well, that is an interesting question, isn't it? How do you uh, specifically do a good for the sake of the good? Well, Kant actually does kind of have a, an answer there, uh, but usually that is not how most people think, right? Most people think of it still like, what is in it for me? I will do good. Remember that Plato was talking about it in the Republic. I will do good because other people then will think I'm a good person and treat me better. So I actually am gaining something from that. Um, it's not that I'm doing good for the sake of the good, but I'm doing good for the sake of the sake of the other people thinking I'm good. Um, and if other people don't even know about it, and worse still, if there's bad things which will happen to me as a result, I'm not gonna do it. Um, that would make me stupid. And who is who wants to be stupid about that? But um, it does seem like there may be a way around it. That's actually interesting the way Kant himself um, explains that. So that kind of um, brings us more towards his uh, practical philosophy when he talks about the reason as uh, a lawgiver. Reason can serve as a rule of behavior. And he's saying that uh, he calls it imperative categorical imperative why does he call it categorical imperative well he talks about first of all hypothetical imperative being if you want this then you do this right uh, so for example you can even say if you want to murder your colleague you should use strong poison <coughs> note that since you put in it as a conditional it doesn't mean that you should do it it just means that if this is the result you are going towards, this is what you should do. How is categorical different? Categorical actually tells you in no uncertain terms, but you should do it. This is what you should do. It doesn't say if. It says that's what you should do. So what is the categorical imperative Kant is talking about? He's saying, well, there's different ways to put it, but there's really just one um, categorical imperative. This is how it works. Act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Simple as that. Anything you do, you should ask yourself, 
do I want it to be a universal law? Do I want everybody to do that? Um, so like one example would be, suppose you want to borrow money, but you don't want to give them back. Well, just ask yourself, suppose everybody would do that. People would borrow money and never give them back. Would that actually work? Would you want to live in a world like this? Same thing with like, if you want to steal something, again, ask yourself, do I want to live in a world where people are stealing from each other? If the answer is any, in any case, no, then you should not do that. Um, and that's how your reason can command you and get you to do these things, even though you may personally feel like, hey, well, what's a big deal? I'll steal a little bit. I'll lie a little bit. Uh, I will break a promise or something. So what? Um, right? I will benefit from that, but um, I'll get away with it. But no, that's not how you should behave because you should listen to your reason. And your reason gives you this command. Note the important difference there too. He's not saying we should do that because um, the world then will be a better place to live in. He's saying that essentially entails a logical contradiction. What is a logical contradiction? The logical contradiction is if you don't want people to steal from each other, then you should not steal because then you contradict in yourself. You don't want people to steal, but you are a person and you are stealing, right? So that is a, just a logical contradiction. And if you use any reason, you should immediately see there is a problem here. Unless you actually want it to be the universal law that people steal from each other, you should never do that. Uh, another way to say the exact same thing according to Kant, the other formulation of the categorical imperative would be this. Act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as means only. So anybody you encounter, don't use them as means to achieve whatever it is you want. Treat them as just as valuable human beings as you are. Uh, in any circumstances, somebody may say, well, so for example, if I go to a grocery store, buy something, don't I treat the cashier as means to get what I want? Well, that depends how are you treating them, right? Uh, you can, of course, let them do their job as they supposed to, uh, bag your groceries, whatever, but still treat them as a human being rather than a grocery packing machine. If you start treating them as a grocery packing machine, that's when you're treating them uh, as means rather than an end. But if you respect them as another human being who essentially is equal to you in any way, then you are treating them as an end rather than the means. And that's how you should do that. Um, so we all are kind of moral legislators in that sense. Uh, the idea of the will of every rational being making universal law, that's how Kant looks at it. Again, from reasonable point of view, from reasoning, not from passion, not from emotion, but from logic and um, our human, pure human reason. So this is what he gets to with his uh, critique of pure reason. And in the end of the critique of pure reason, he already talks about it. And then, like I said, he developed it further in this other critiques. Um, but we have to be uh, bound by this moral law that we all are legislators um, of the world we live in. And each one of us is a legislator. We are creating this moral law. We all are uh, complicit in what's going on. So we should use this ability, which other animals, for example, do not have. Um, they cannot shape their world in that way. We can, and we should. Uh, so the three postulates of morality he thinks we should accept, even though we have no proofs of them, is first of all the human freedom. That's again part of the nomena, but nonetheless we should accept the fact that 
there is human freedom because otherwise we cannot even think meaningfully about responsibility. If there's no human freedom, there's no responsibility. The second one is immortality. You may think, why do we need immortality? Well, he explains it in the following way. He says, during our lifetime, it does seem like some people who are very evil still um, get some sorts of benefits and so on. It's kind of hard to see how a good person would necessarily be rewarded for being good. So we only can meaningfully understand it if we have the idea of immortality, of people living over and over and over again and being able to achieve greater results over many lives rather than one life. And finally, the idea of God. Uh, that's something, again, which you need in order to uh, really put it all together. But uh, those are just the postulates. Essentially, he's saying we can't know any of these things uh, real, but we should assume them to be real because this is necessary. This is just one of those necessities. Uh, okay, so a few words about the exam uh, before we conclude. So remember, the exam will be on the 9th, which is Monday, right? Uh, second midterm exam. Uh, I will post the study guide tonight and as usual it will come from those questions which we do at the beginning of each class including today uh, and starting from whatever we started covering after the previous midterm. All the questions again will come from a study guide. The study guide will be longer and we'll have more questions but whatever will be on the exam will match that. So make sure that you remember there's no class on Monday. Instead this is the day of the exam. The exam will be there. Um, you have to take it and then there's also no class on Wednesday because that is actually a holiday. There are no classes on 11th. So next time we will meet will be 16th of November, which is well, two weeks from today. Uh, well, almost two weeks, 12 days. Any questions? No questions? That's all clear? Is Kant clear? Did you understand Kant? Well, you can watch the lecture again. That's the beauty of having it recorded, right? I will put it up and the first one is there. This one will be there. So um, if you are unclear, watch it again. You also can read the chapter in the book. And of course, make sure you do the homework on Kant. Um, they also have these videos and like explanations, which helps to put it all um, in slightly different um, perspective. Perhaps that will help. Kant, like I said, is very important. Once we start talking about Schopenhauer, you have to understand what I was talking about today. Otherwise, you will not understand any of it. Um, Schopenhauer reacts directly to Kant and in fact like I said pretty much everything after that is related to Kant um, so that's a very very huge important watershed and I hope you notice that his philosophy is rather awesome um, so if you uh, want to know how things really work that kind of gives you a little bit of a uh, at least understanding of uh, how things really work um, other than just empty speculation. Um, not everybody, not all philosophers agree with Kant. There's been, of course, all sorts of criticism since then. Nonetheless, everybody accepts the fact that he is great and he has certainly came up here with something um, absolutely new and unusual and different from everything that was before him. Okay, I um, thought for some reason I was running out of time. I actually wasn't running out of time so much but uh, I guess we have covered everything in good time unless you have anything else I guess we can conclude and then don't forget to do the homework 
take the exam and start working on the essay because that's all you need to do between now and the 16th i'll put the reading for schopenhauer next week um, probably after the exam because i don't think you will need more than a week to do that there's no point doing it yet but um, i will send you a message about that later and i guess uh, it is all for now okay well thank you guys and um, see you next week or rather week after the next week bye bye